everyone, welcome to the election show on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer, Associate Professor of Political Science at Fordham University and co-host of the FAQ NYC podcast. Joining me today, as always, via Zoom is Matt McDermott, Communication Strategist and Vice President of Whitman Insight Strategies, and also with me is Political Analyst and Professor of Political Science at Columbia University, Lincoln Mitchell. How are you, gentlemen? Great to be with you again. <laughs> All right, nice to see you both. So we live to, to fight another week. <laughs> We've had quite an exciting week. By the time this airs, will be two months to election day uh, and things are gearing up. So I wanna talk uh, about our dear president and obviously about Joe Biden also, who's, who's running uh, a pretty interesting campaign since we've never been in quarantine like this in an election year and also battling a global pandemic for the first time in a hundred years. So Lincoln, I'll start with you because you've been ringing the alarm from day one that we started this show uh, about uh, the threat that the president poses to American democracy. And just last week, the president went to North Carolina and essentially encouraged voters to vote twice. And we have that old Chicago saying, vote early and often. But this is the first time a sitting president has said, uh, go ahead, uh, do whatever you can uh, just to assess, to see how much fraud is going on. Uh, but that is a, a, a felony. Uh, to do so, and it's a it's a real danger for for many uh, because it's coming from uh, the most powerful person in the United States. So walk us through uh, where we go from here, with the president essentially telling his supporters, not all Americans, but just his supporters, uh, that they should vote uh, as 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 often as possible. I'll try to be concise. The president is doing a few things that really qualify as already trying to steal the election. So he has told his voters to vote more than once. He has, he and his party have put barriers in front of some voters, specifically African-American Latino voters, to make it harder for them to vote, which is a form of election fraud. It is stealing the election, making it harder for some people, those that are gonna vote against you to vote. He has planted doubts against mail-in voting, and he has basically said, I mean, Matt Gates came out and said this, we will declare victory on election night. That's what he said at the RNC convention. What we're seeing now this last week or so is not that Trump is going to refuse to leave or refuse to accept defeat if he loses. I've known that for three years now. What we're seeing is how that will shake out, what that will look like kind of in the hour by hour. And what that, a key issue here is that the election day itself votes may be more heavily Trump than the rest of the votes. And that there are laws on the books in most swing states that say you can't start counting absentee ballot, mail-in ballots until the day of the election, or in some cases the day after the election in which case those votes won't be counted until days or perhaps weeks after the election. So what Donald Trump is doing now is really pushing for saying essentially, don't count all the votes. We've seen the Republican Party go to that well before. That's what got us George W. Bush. So this is a really a multi-vectored attempt to steal the election. One of the problems, one of the many problems with stealing the election is that it taints the victory for whichever side wins it. Even if Donald Trump manages to pull out kind of an extraordinary comeback here, let's say he gets a vaccine tomorrow and a, and a brain the next day and a heart the day after that and becomes a competent president and somehow manages to bump himself past Biden, there will be doubts about his victory. He has made it impossible for himself to win in a way that is perceived as being a fair victory. What that leads me to think is that, is that what I don't understand, let me put this in the negative rather than the positive, how do we avoid violent conflict after this election? Not might there be, but how do we avoid it? I think that's a more fruitful way, although a more depressing way and a more frightening way to look at the problem. Right, and we'll talk about some of the uprisings that are happening across the country and some of the violence that we've seen from these private security firms and also police officers. But Matt, I wanna bring you in because, you know, as Lincoln has laid out this multi-pronged approach of Donald Trump and his administration attempting to steal the election, as a democratic strategist, what should Joe Biden and his camp do when we've seen the defunding of the United States Postal Service? We've seen the president saying that any uh, results that aren't uh, declared on November 3rd will be absolute fraud. We've seen that you know he's going to target particular zip codes in particular states uh, just to make sure that they're um, deemed not, not worthy, not valuable, and not credible. So how does Joe Biden in 62 days or 60 days until election day uh, really try and reverse this trend that seems to be working uh, in Donald Trump's favor. And, and to me, that really is the, the story of this election, right, is both presidential campaigns are running completely incongruent strategies. You've got Joe Biden 
just straight up trying to win a majority of voters, 50 plus one of voters, and using a strategy to not only hold his base and, and mobilize progressives, but try to win over swing voters, independents, suburban women, things like that, because their strategy is to win a majority of voters. That is not Donald Trump's strategy. And I think we just need to be honest about that. Donald Trump is not trying to win a majority of voters in this election. In fact, his own consultants have said explicitly they don't intend to win the popular vote. That's just not their strategy. Uh, and so they're trying to run uh, really a straight through to the Electoral College uh, and using the levers that they have advantage to them, including, as you mentioned, the Postal Service, to try and you know, some people would say rig, other would, you know, use slightly, you know, less uh, aggressive words. But nonetheless, what they're doing is, is using the levers to their advantage to try to disenfranchise voters. And they don't need to win the popular vote, as was clear in 2016. All they need to do is do exactly what they need, win just enough votes in the states they need to win to get by. And so that's really why you see this dynamic playing out, wherein any voter is looking at what's happening on their TV and saying, this is so strange. Why is Donald Trump trying to do what he's doing? Because it's not working to get him to a majority. Their intent is never to get to a majority. And I think we just need to realize that. And moving forward, I think it speaks to what needs to happen in terms of reforms of our democracy down the line, because we can't keep living in a society in which one political party has an advantage in our presidential system wherein they don't need to win a majority of our voters. It's just bad for our system of government. And it leads to a situation where you can have a president of the United States going up on stage and essentially saying, what happens in blue states doesn't matter to me. I don't care about those people. It's just bad for our process. And we could see over the last four years how it's played out in real time. Right. And, you know, as someone who teaches American politics, you know, I... When, when people want to throw out the Electoral College, I've always actually been the one that says, well, wait a second, because the two examples we have in modern history are 2000 with Bush v. Gore. And for me, that was a little bit of an asterisk because his brother was in charge of the state and you know, we saw uh, the winner of the popular vote uh, becomes the president, not the winner of the, or the winner of the popular vote is not elected and the winner of the Electoral College is. And so that to me was a, an instance where uh, I thought, well, there's a problem with our system, but I'm not willing to get rid of it just yet because this is sort of one example. And we also have some, some interesting variables going on with the Bush family. Fast forward 16 years, we see Hillary Clinton getting 3 million more votes than Donald Trump and not becoming president of the United States, which does raise the question. So in the future, moving forward, we can't have a system where the popular vote winner uh, is, is not elected and we have this convoluted antiquated system where people in particular states get to choose our president. That system over the last few years, just to be clear, has gotten even worse. So I mean, yes. the latest modeling that's been done essentially suggests that Joe Biden could win 5 million more votes nationally this mm -hmm. year and still lose the Electoral College. Anyone looking at this fairly would realize that that is not a system that puts forth what's best for the majority of the American people. If you're a person who could win 5 million more votes nationally right. and still lose, that is the system we need to honestly sit down and, and think about whether it's good for our country and if we should be doing something different. Well, well Lincoln, yeah, I wanna, I wanna bring you in because also who would decide that? I mean, we see the calcification and polarization within the legislative branch. How would that even come about? I could just pick on one other issue with the Electoral College, which is that it has another equal a pernicious effect it doesn't have to do with outcomes so much but what it does is it turns citizens into spectators the majority of americans whether you are dedicated to the resistance and want to see joe biden win or whether you've got your maga hat and your trump t-shirt and want donald trump to win the majority of voters are spectators right if you live in new york regardless of where you are on the spec on the political spectrum here you've got to leave the state to be to matter and Participation is a core principle of democracy. The Electoral College undermines that. The Electoral College can be defended on the ground that it's constitutional or American, but it's not democratic. There's no rational defense of the Electoral College on the ground that it's democratic. Also, by the way, it actually minimizes the relevance of small states because very few small states are swing states. One of the things you hear defenders say is that, well, if, there, if there's no Electoral College, people wouldn't campaign in small states. Well, no one campaigns in Wyoming, right? right? Or Rhode Island. In the, in the mid and late 20th century, most of the larger states were in fact competitive. 
So in 1960, Kennedy, Nixon, 1976, Ford versus Carter, the last really competitive races of the 20th century, New York, Texas, and California were in play. Well, if New York, Texas, and California play, the whole country is in play. How do we, how do we um, get rid of this? Well, you know, the Constitution, which was written over 200 years ago, was a, as a, what we were taught in school as a kind of breakthrough democratic uh, document, has now become a bludgeon to stop discussion about democracy. You can't change it because it's Constitution. The short answer is we only change this when we really, we start by wrestling with the assault on democracy that has been the Trump administration. And then we go from the, there to the need for holistic change. And then we as a country decide we want to be a democracy. But if we don't do that, this is gonna be around and it's going to get worse. Well, I mean, I, I, I do worry that, you know, this is this may be our final shot to get it right. And as, as you and Matt were speaking, you know, the pit in my stomach grew because it reminded me a lot of, of 2018 and Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp. And that when you were laying out sort of the strategy of Joe Biden, it reminded me of Stacey Abrams. I'm going to get more votes than my opponent. I'm going to do it the right way. And Brian Kemp essentially said, well, my strategy is to make sure that I disenfranchise as many people and essentially try and lie, cheat, and steal if I can, you know, making sure uh, machines don't get to particular communities, making sure ballots don't get in those machines, making sure the, the plugs for those machines aren't delivered. And so this is, this is sadly, when I try and explain this to my students, this erosion, if I'm feeling as though the democratic process is being eroded. I really worry about sort of these new voters and first time voters who are seeing our process and, and becoming quite disillusioned by it. Now I wanna shift gears ever so slightly and Lincoln, I'll start with you. Um, the president has also uh, possibly promised a vaccine just in time for election day, just like the, you know, the TV shows promise, right? Uh, before the season finale, we're gonna have a new surprise. How much of a, a factor will that be uh, for some voters if a vaccine is put forth to the American public? Well, I would start by saying that's an enormous if, right? I mean, obviously no guarantee. <laughs> well, hey, he I, says it, so somehow, you know, he can just keep no, saying no, it and no, somehow no. miraculously becomes true. If a vaccine does come about, if it's just Donald Trump saying, I have this vaccine, I think the majority of the American people are not going to believe him because he's cited other hoaxy ideas too, you know, drink, drink disinfectant, which is just so we're clear on this show, don't do that, right? Right. Um, if, you know, Dr. Fauci and others said, this is a vaccine and you should try it. I don't know that it, and Trump will do his victory lap. I, I, I solved the problem, but, but there's also, by then there'll be well over 200,000 dead Americans. So certainly it is good for Trump if that happens. Does it sway the election? I don't know that it sways an election that right now is, is separated by eight points. On the other hand, we do have some, some very close states. So clearly, it is good for Trump if there is a vaccine. It is good for America if there's a vaccine because it will save lives. And, and the Democrats have to be clear on their messaging here. We want to do anything we can to get to a safe and effective vaccine as soon as possible. And Donald Trump has mishandled the pandemic in a criminal way that is probably qualifies as crimes against humanity. Right. Those two facts and ideas can exist at the same time. Right. And so, Matt, as, as the strategist, though, how does Joe Biden sort of, on the one hand, say, yes, I absolutely want a vaccine. We, our numbers are consistently growing, unlike most countries. But at the same time, saying, well, this, you know, if, if a vaccine is put to market, saying, well, maybe this isn't the best vaccine, since we know that Donald Trump's going to push through whatever he can just for an election day bump. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, it, it just like, let's just step back and, and look at that what if as a hypothesis. The idea that not only, even if we used an emergency authorization, a vaccine would be created, approved, and somehow we find, you know, 350 million syringes in this country, produce that vaccine and get it out to the American people in the next 10 weeks. It, it's just a, on its face a bit of a ludicrous idea and every health expert has said so. So I think we just need to keep our mm -hmm. expectations in check. In terms of sort of the political ramifications, the story to me of this election is honestly pretty simple. It's that the American people don't do trust Donald Trump on anything, right? On any political issue. You look at the public health crisis, you look at even the issues of systemic racism and, and recent police brutality uh, and issues therein. And you look at the polling on it, Voters trust Joe Biden over Donald Trump on every single one of these issues. And so I think that the trouble the Trump campaign is having, which is why they're sort of, 
you know, veering left and right on all of these issues on any given day is they don't have a winning strategy here. There is no single issue that the American people believe that Donald Trump is more effective than Joe Biden, and they trust Donald Trump to manage that issue effectively. And so you see this campaign wherein, you know, one day Donald Trump is in Kenosha saying Joe Biden wants to burn down America. The next day, going back to Washington and saying that he's rolling out this new vaccine. The next day, trumpeting the economic numbers, even though tens of millions of Americans are either out of work or underemployed right now, given the crisis that we face. And so it's just this veering from one issue to another because they haven't landed on a strategy that actually works. On the flip side, I think one of the both challenges for Joe Biden, but something that I think they're cognizant of is the need to stay the course. Is given the fact that you have an incumbent president who's veering from left to right, and the single biggest concern among voters is just an unhinged president that they have today, that he can't just sit down and focus on what is the biggest public health crisis that we face right now. I think the Biden campaign, you know, for better or worse, uh, is speaking and communicating about stability. The need for a president to actually just sit down, handle these issues, come up with a plan, and stick to that plan. And I, to Lincoln's point, what we've seen over the last seven months is a president that can't do that. Seven months into this crisis, 200,000 Americans dead, millions of Americans out of work, and we still have no plan from this White House in terms of how to get this country back on track. That is the single biggest issue in this election. And I think we'll continue to see that hamper Donald Trump moving forward in part because he hasn't been able to do it to date. Right, but so Matt, what you've laid out so clearly, you and Lincoln, makes sense to many rational voters. I'm a behavioralist, but they're, you know, they're sort of two wings of political science. Unfortunately, there are a lot of irrational voters. There's a lot of irrational voters, but here's the thing. If, both of you are saying most Americans think that this president is erratic. Most Americans, or many Americans, who are being polled, which I have, you know, I have thoughts about polling. But so many Americans are saying he's erratic. He's not handling the crisis. He hasn't handled the economic crisis. We're going into a recession, if not a depression. We, we are one of the laughingstock countries of the world. We can't go anywhere. There are only what, seven countries now that'll take us. All of these things, economic indicators, health indicators, this man has literal literally no empathy, no moral compass, the list can go on and on. So why is it that there's a real concern that this man, meaning Donald Trump, uh, could not just win the Electoral College, but get another four years? Well, Lincoln, I'll start with you. Well, there is, Donald Trump has offered a cohesive vision and platform to a substantial uh, numer numerically speaking, minority of American voters, but a big minority that resonates very deeply. Mm -hmm. right? So it is, it is around a, a core set of issues but the, at the core of which is, is race and white supremacy, right? Your white skin means you are a, have a higher level of citizenship than everybody else. It is an extremely powerful message and has been since the founding of this country. So mm -hmm. Trump benefits from that, right? So that, 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 that means that you're never, never going to get below about 40, 45%. There is additionally a partisan loyalty here that is, to me, kind of appalling. But, you know, we've kind of fetishized, not we on the show, but we are the kind of punditry community, have fetishized the white working class. But it is affluent whites who've also been voting for Trump yes. currently, consistently numbers because they like the tax cuts. The, and, and they're okay with the racism or they like the racism. The one area where Trump's numbers are okay is this narrative of, I was doing great on the economy, and then the pandemic came, but only I can rebuild it. If you were doing well beforehand, and if you don't mind the racism and all of that, that is still a potent message. The other issue is that they have worked very hard systemically to make sure this is not a free and fair election. This goes back to 2013, right, in the Supreme Court, right? At, at that moment, right, when the Supreme Court made the decision and essentially gutted the Voting Rights Act, it was clear we were not, the, the era of free and fair elections and, and democracy at the presidential level that began in 1968 was ending. And I always remind people that we went to the polls for the first time in 2016 without the full protection of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Right, exactly, since 64. So we've had this window between 68 and 2012 where we had essentially what looked like a democracy. Mm -hmm. Now we don't. Could Donald Trump win a free, fair, and democratic election where everyone could vote mattered equally? I don't even think Donald Trump thinks he could do that. Right. Uh, Matt, <laughs> why is it? I mean, we know racism is strong. We know that uh, Donald Trump plays into this idea that white citizenship 
mean something more than others. Uh, we know that it's not just uh, the coal miners who are voting for Donald Trump. It's wealthy whites. We've, we've seen yachters for, tr for Trump over the past the few voters. weekends. The voters, like the voters are going to be the voters, right? We've seen white women consistently vote for the Republican candidate, even though polling suggests that they might take a break, but I don't buy it. Um, so why is it that he has the stronghold uh, that seems like it's actually more than 40 or 45 percent. We have a large minority in this country who's willing to overlook racism, overlook misogyny, overlook xenophobia, overlook Islamophobia, overlook anti-gay rhetoric uh, for, you know, whatever you want to call it, economic issues, I, I believe is the, the kosher way of saying it these days. And that's what Donald Trump did in 2016 was saying, I am a businessman and ignore all of these other aspects of who I am, I can bring home the bacon and I can cut your taxes and I can get you back to work. And it worked for him. What, what I've always said, look, I, you know, I'm a Democratic consultant. I am not one to give advice to the Trump campaign. But if Donald Trump had sat down in March and said, this pandemic is going to be a, a difficult situation, one that could affect my reelection, I need to actually sit down and come up with a plan to address this. And he, he came up with a plan, he implemented a plan. Had he just done that, he would be sailing to re-election today. There is no doubt in my mind that if the Trump administration effectively handled this pandemic and the economic ramifications of it, Donald Trump would be winning re-election in a few months. The problem is, like every other issue that has faced him in his entire life, he has not handled it. He is in part because he's not a businessman, right? He's a fraud. And so he's handled every issue that's faced him as a president as the fraud that he is. And the difficulty for him among voters right now is those who can ac accept all of those other things about Donald Trump are saying, you know what? I I'm OK with sort of his you know, racism on Twitter. But like I, I just got fired because I don't have a job anymore. My, you know, my mother just passed away because of coronavirus. You saw in the Democratic Convention. Um, the, the daughter of the father who passed away because of coronavirus because she trusted Donald Trump. Those are real American stories, people who have been able to overlook all the other elements of Donald Trump so long as the economy is strong and we're not facing a massive public health crisis. Had he just resolved those issues, he'd be winning re-election right now. The reality, though, is that he can't because he's a failed president. Right. Well, it's interesting, though, because, as you said, he put the economy before the public health of the nation. But, you know, people don't run on the economy, per se. I mean, we, we need actually a leader who, who understood what this virus could do. And now the economy is sinking uh, because of his, his failures uh, as a leader, which is so frightening. Now, here's, here's something that's, that's been catching a lot of attention. The growing number of Republicans who are coming out to support Joe Biden largely because of what Matt, you just said, uh, the president's failure uh, to handle the coronavirus and also our tanking economy and also the fact that the racism, the xenophobia, the anti-gay rhetoric, the anti-Semitism, which is very specific and unique for this particular president, uh, has just finally gotten to be too much for them. In addition to that, we have this younger generation, Gen Zers, who are hardcore Trumpites, uh, who love the president, they love his rhetoric, they like this bombastic style. Uh, so we're seeing this sort of crossing of, of the, the, two, um, the two bases or potential bases. Uh, Lincoln, what are your thoughts on the Republicans for Biden and the, the young people for Trump? Well, the Republicans for Biden is interesting for two reasons. One, these are not the usual suspects, the old liberal Republicans from the 1960s who are still, still around and always support the Democrat. These are influential, mm -hmm. important Republicans. I mean, John Kasich and Susan Molinari are hardly liberal. You know, the people behind the Lincoln Project have been behind some of the nastiest right-wing campaigns of, of, previous, of the last generation. So, and they're coming out very explicitly, not I don't like Trump, but vote for Biden. So I think that is powerful. That is important because Joe Biden's campaign, and we've talked about this before, is a small D democratic campaign in that he's trying to restore democracy. And to do that, you need a broad coalition, not an ideological one. Um, as far as the Gen Z, let's, let's be clear about a couple of things. Joe Biden will win the Gen Z vote big, right? What we're talking about is a minority within Generation Z, I think we should, goes without saying, overwhelmingly white, who are responding to Trump. But, you know, I have two Gen Z kids who are not uh, voting for Trump, but 
you know, I see their, their, their world and their online world a little bit and the, the kind of far right and white supremacist rhetoric and campaigns have been targeting those young Americans, young white Americans for quite a long time and it's beginning to show some fruit. So again, if right. only people under 25 voted, Biden wins in a landslide, but there are gonna be some hardline Trump people. And lastly, if you are a hardline Trump person and you're young or in college, they bring you in and they throw this money at you to make it easy. I mean, Ben Shapiro oh. and Charlie Kirk between them have an IQ that's like lower than bat <laughs> Gary Clinton's batting average. And they're both rich and famous because right. you're willing to say these stupid nonsense right. right wing things. Right. And we've seen that with black Trump supporters too. You get, you know, fast track to the front of the line. Um, so in the last two minutes we have, Matt, what are your thoughts on, on some of the Republicans for Biden and the, the possible young people for Trump? And we saw them in Charlottesville and we keep seeing them obviously in Kenosha and Portland and in cities all across the country. Yeah, I, for me, the only sort of interesting democratic, uh, democratic demographic tension in this election right now is Biden among Biden support among Latino voters. And that's one of the stranger things in this election cycle in that Biden's basically doing better among every vote cohort in this country. The only exception is Latino voters where he's actually underperforming Hillary Clinton by quite a bit. Um, there's reasons for that. Uh, I think the Biden campaign you've seen this week, especially uh, is really ramping up their strategy among Latino voters. He's been uh, on TV, Telemundo and others this week. He's hired uh, a huge uh, Latino team to, to handle sort of his communication with that community, particularly in Florida and Arizona. That is one area that I think the Biden campaign is in a bit of trouble right now and needs to focus on in part because Donald Trump has, for better or worse, been able to make inroads with that community given some of his rhetoric among other communities that aren't right. the, the Hispanic and Latino community. Uh, and I think the Biden team does need to, to work on that heading into November. Uh, otherwise, I, I mean, it's clear based on, you know, sort of any numbers you look at, Biden is basically doing better than Hillary Clinton everywhere except that that community of voters. Well, I can't wait to pick up that, that train of thought next time we come because I think that there's some interesting things about immigration economics that could uh, explain yeah. uh, some of the work that Biden needs to do with the Latino community. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. That's all the time we have. And thank you so much for being with me here today. I'm Dr. Christina Greer. You've been watching the election show on MNN. Take good care.